What's up, knucklehead? I am Lupine Fiasco, and this is your Daily Fab Gameplay. For anyone who's new to the channel, welcome to the jungle. What we do here is review replays of games that I played on the Talishar client days or weeks ago, after enough time has passed, that I lose my bias and can more objectively judge the quality of my play. I'll talk through turn cycles and give my thoughts on the line I would take now, compared to the line I took then at the time of recording. We either learn from my mistakes or reinforce good play patterns with the overall goal of tightening and optimizing our gameplay in the future, to take down paper events like the upcoming U.S. Nationals, and most importantly, walk away with that shiny, shiny cardboard. If you would like to check out the deck I'm playing here or try it for yourself on Talishar, there is a Fabry deck link available in the video description below. While you're down there, if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to my channel. A YouTube subscription is the best free way to support me and to make sure that you see daily fab gameplay in your video feed five days a week. The best paid way to support me is through Patreon, and a Patreon link is also in the video description. A Patreon subscription will get you access to the DFG Discord and the shiny, shiny cardboard Talishar card back. At higher tiers, your name will appear in every DFG video. You'll get bonus DFG content every week, and there are even more benefits to come. Daily Fab gameplay will always be free five days a week, so for those who can afford to patronize me, I truly appreciate it. Now, let's talk about our sideboard and about our game plan. Capping off our initial exploration of the three Mistfell heroes on Daily Fab gameplay, we have Enigma, who is not everyone's boogeyman, but he is mine. Uh, of the three Mistfell heroes, at least for now, she is the one that I am having the hardest time wrapping my head around. She plays much closer to Dromai than she does to Prism, and as much as she is setting up a board state, she has permanents that she can play from hand that don't go away if we don't make them. And in her uh, best iteration, she is going to put down multiple auras with Ward and just send damage turn after turn if we aren't able to clear that board. Unlike Dromai, we can't directly target the ward auras, which can be very devastating depending on which ones they are. So the name of the game here really is Action Points. We want to be going wide enough and tall enough that Enigma cannot block all of the damage to protect her ward and she can rebuild it, and in many cases that is her game plan, to build ward, attack with it, lose the ward, rebuild. But she only has so much ward that is really that great, and as soon as she runs through those, if we are clearing her auras, she's going to start drawing some real clunkers and not be able to keep up with our damage output. Uh, at this point, I do have an Enigma sideboard plan, Notably, it does run Spring Tunic and not Savage Sash. The idea being that we want Cast Bones in this matchup. And in any matchup where we run Cast Bones, we are playing Tunic. I don't know if Cast Bones is going to end up being correct. It does more damage over two turns than something like a uh, Wild Rider or Pulping would deal on one turn at the same time. I think we may be looking at a situation as with Katsu, where we can't afford to give Enigma time to just keep auras on the field. Um, send packing, in my experience, has been unlikely to hit. So similar to Warrior, rather than play a clunky 3 for 6 that doesn't do the thing we want it to do, we'll just cut it. But like I said, the name of the game here is Action Point Economy and just sending damage at Enigma. For the most part, we cannot target her board. She will play Spectra. As far as I know, Enigmas are uh, playing around with which auras those are, but at the very least, Haze Bending and Shimmers of Silver are the top two contenders for making the finalized tuned list. Haze Bending, in my opinion, is worth killing if you can find the time for it, but otherwise is not 
going to give Enigma really the space to develop anything further. It can definitely pair very well with Phantom Tide Maw, especially in multiples, but for the most part, I think we're better off just sending damage at Enigma's face. Shimmers of Silver is a different story, and I've learned through painful experience that Shimmers, especially in multiples, when paired with Manifestation of Miragai, arguably the best card in Enigma's deck, uh, that can be a very uh, devastating combo to play against. Not only is it very good offensively, but it is very good defensively. And we just need to be able to punch through Enigma's ward. So I wish I could tell you more about this matchup. I'm still learning. This is really what I'm dedicating my time to. I think Enigma, from what I've heard, is set to be the top competitor at Nationals. Coming from Mistvale, she is really the best of the three. And a few early tier lists I've seen have put her up in that high A, S tier with Kale. And if we can figure out how to make it a 50-50 matchup, or at least uh, maybe even a 60-40, if we can go above 50-50, then we're in a really great spot. I think the tools are there, and I need to figure out what they are. But at least with the tools we have here, uh, let's jump into the game, and we can get our first look at Enigma. So right from the start, um, we see that Enigma is on a different weapon than what I had expected her to be on. She is not on Cosmo, which would give um, her auras with plus one counters go again. She is on Reality Refractor, which is uh, sort of grown up Iris of Reality. Her auras all have uh, five base power and a once per turn attack action. They don't have go again innately. So if Enigma can cheat action points, then she could attack with multiple auras, but for the most part, this is more of a mid-rangey build where Enigma is likely running more three blocks as opposed to auras with ward with the intention of protecting a single aura every turn and sending that damage. If she can convert three three blocks and a blue into 14 damage, 14 value, that's really good value. And if we are unable to punch through that, if she can make a second aura now, then we're gonna have a really hard time keeping the board clear and eventually we're just on a clock where we're taking five damage every turn. I uh, went first in this game. Generally, I do like to do that against Enigma. At least for now, I think it's the correct play. Similar to Prism, we want to end our first turn with an action point so that we have the ability to send something at Enigma if she plays a aura at instant speed. Here, I didn't like that idea. This opening hand is absolute garbage. Um, we have no way to cheat action points. We have no windups to generate additional resources on turn one. So rather than arsenal a swing big and keep a blue and two, two for sixes without go again, I like just clearing some of the hand, filtering a bit on my own, and then arsenaling the swing big. Um, I'm not expecting this pack hunt to hit. I would be very surprised if Enigma took any damage from this. On the other hand, she could block maybe three, take three, and then play something with Ward. Instead, she is just gonna block the six, and we are going to arsenal this swing big. No real other notable equipment on Enigma's side of the field. Um, everything is, is what I would expect to see. Levels of Enlightenment, really great card. Not something that I am going to block. Um, we'll just take three here. It does have go again. The hand that we do have is okay. I would open with a wild ride and just try to go three lengths wide this turn. That is really the game plan here. Enigma getting that early transcendence is great for her just trying to put uh, auras on the table, but also works very well tra with uh, Transverse the Universe as she now has a chi to find. Enigma with a really cool play here. 
uh, using playing haze bending at instant speed to cheat the action point and then attack for five. Our consideration is going to be how we take this off the table. As much as I think haze bending is a low priority generally, Reality Refractor worries me because this is an aura that we can't clear by sending damage at Enigma's face. If this was a spectral shield, then I'm, I don't care about it. It will die. But haze bending just existing is something that I am concerned about, and the spectra is going to make it difficult to clear if we keep five cards and try to send five go again, three, swing big for eight. I don't want to send eight at this haze bending. I want to send it at Enigma's face. So how I'm looking at playing out this turn is I would like to discard Agile Windup at the end of Enigma's turn to make a quicken. Then I can attack with Swing Big from Arsenal, send that at Enigma's face, it'll have go again, and then pitch the Wild Ride to attack Haze Bending with Mandible Claw. That all means that I'm not blocking this, and I am going to ultimately Arsenal this Pulping. Enigma does play defense reactions, Pulping does have a chance to get stuffed, but I, I just like sending it, uh, arsenaling it more than I like arsenaling Wild Ride. I think that's going to be fine. I agree in the past uh, with that same assessment, so we are just going to throw Swing Big at Enigma's face and let her do her thing. Currently she is taking 8 with this ward on the table. She will take 5 because she's pitched a blue she is going to make a spectral shield at the end of it. Hold the line here um, just being a blue 2. Notably this is a blue card so if Enigma is able to uh, transcend the, or it will enable Enigma to transcend this turn if she has the ability to do so. Claw coming in for three. We are sending that at the haze bending. Enigma is able to transcend. She is just going to gain a life and make a chi. Thankfully, she cannot use these floating two resources, so most likely she's going to pitch this chi to attack with a spectral shield. That is pretty neat. Do we want to block? The answer is yes. I would like Clash of Agility to make me an agility. Also, let us know what's on top of our deck for this Enlightened Strike. Uh, Clash revealing another E-Strike. We do win. Uh, we know that Enigma potentially has Ward 4 in her next hand. That's all fine and good. So, how I would like to play this, considering that we have a pulping in our arsenal, is just going to be E-Strike, E-Strike, which I think is perfectly fine. We can take advantage of the agility by just playing E-Strike, bottoming the Wrecker Romp, drawing a card, and then playing the second E-Strike by bottoming this windup to come in for a total of 13. We miss out on our KO trigger to make Might, but we are just sending 13 damage and we are clearing these Spectral Shields off of Enigma's side of the field. So he is going to have to find a way to make another aura while also having an action point very doable i'm not saying like oh we got her because she can't do that especially if she is breaking traverse the universe here she's going to get one of those two chi in her deck and at the very least be able to turn that into a spectral shield that will not use her action point and be able to attack for something like six We see that Ward 4 coming down. It's going to soak up more damage. Currently only getting one point through. If I'm not mistaken, that was the Chi. So here is where uh, Enigma will be able to use that floating resource to play an aura at instant speed and then can uh, very likely pitch to attack with it. Instead, just attack him with Mirage and Metamorph. This is spooky because I don't want Prism to, uh, I don't want Edimba to copy this aura, which means that I cannot use either of these poppers in my hand. I'm either gonna take seven, which I don't love, 
or I'm going to have to block with Enlighten Strike. It's unfortunate that this hand is all red. I wish there was a blue in here so that we could at least open with a Pulping and potentially uh, convert more of this hand to offense. But considering that these are four red cards, our options are a little limited. I don't mind blocking with E-Strike and just sending Bear Fangs for eight. We'll make a Might and still hold on to that Pulping. Uh, as much as I would like to pop this, I really cannot have a, uh, a second Waning Vengeance is the name of this card. Raging Metamorph, really spooky uh, with Enigma. Looking with Savage Sash is fine. I don't know that I'm going to use it this turn. I'd be very... Uh, very unlikely to do so, though it is possible that we could play the pulping, pitch one of these reds, keep the uh, pitch the runner runner, and on our turn, you know, following that, either play Bear Fangs or Command and Conquer. But it seems pretty low value. I don't mind this line. We just attack for eight, make a might, and still have our pulping and Savage Sash. We'll watch Enigma do all of her nonsense. I got a Phantom Tide Maw, Transcending. Currently, Enigma is warding five damage. She would have to cover uh, three more to take no damage, but have to cover uh, eight in total between her Waning Vengeance uh, and Blocks from Hand in order to keep the Phantom Tide Maw. Enigma will be using the ability. So at this point, covering eight damage total. And because she's pitched a blue card, the Waning Vengeance is going to make another Spectral Shield. This one, thankfully, won't have a one one counter on it, so we're only taking five damage instead of six. Um, but it does mean that Enigma has an aura. We are looking at five here. So thinking about how we want to block this, we don't currently have go again. We could just say no blocks and send this pulp in from Arsenal. My concern is that Edigba has had her Arsenal card for a few turns now. And while she has been able to consistently make an aura without using the Arsenal, I am worried that it's a defense reaction and our pulping is gonna get stuffed. So I like blocking with Clash of Agility here and on our turn, we can send 12 damage with Bear Fang's Mandible Claw. You can also see if that line is even good. If, if we had a miss on top of our deck, we'd be able to swing big Mandible Claw. Though at the same time, if we had a miss on top of our deck, we wouldn't get agility. So at that point, maybe we do just play Pulping. Um, we know that we have a hit on top of our deck, so we are going to take the value line by playing Bear Fangs rather than Swing Big. I do like over pitching here because between uh, potentially keeping a Swing Big or a Clash of Agility in my deck, I would rather keep Swing Big. So if we pitch our Smash Instinct, we potentially discard that Swing Big. Whereas if we over pitch, then we know that we keep the swing big in our deck. We get those two resources either way, which is what is going to pay for Mandible Claw. Third Waning Vengeance comes down, which is, I mean, it's a good card. I, I'm unhappy to see them all this early at the same time. Um, at least now they are all gone. There really is no reason for us to attack with Pulping here. Either Enigma loses the Spectral Shield and doesn't have an aura to attack with, or she blocks with the card turn hand and has nothing to pitch to attack with the Spectral Shield. Uh, it looks like Tunic is sitting on one right now, so she, uh, Enigma would not have Tunic to pay for the uh, Refractor attack. Enigma playing Ward from Arsenal. Pitching a blue from hand to pay for it. 
This hand looks pretty good. We have a Pulping and Arsenal, a five card Blood Rush, and Savage Sash. I have no inclination to block this uh, attack. We are just going to keep a five card Blood Rush, see if we can pair it with Sash, and if we can make something happen. Blood Rush coming down first. Enigma has no arsenal, so I feel great about having a pulping in my arsenal. Thinking about the cards we have in hand, with two floating resources, we could open with Mandible Claw, attack with Wild Ride by pitching this blue, then whatever we draw, pitch that to attack with pulping. That's a three link Blood Rush, uh, but why not get a four link Blood Rush? We're gonna be able to break Savage Sash here, but because we only have one blue in hand and two floating resources, I would really like to pitch this blue in my hand rather than risk discarding it to a wild ride. So I'm going to attack with Mandible Claw first. Let's see if we can bait any blocks out of Enigma. KO does not benefit in any real way by uh, keeping a continuous combat chain. If we attack with Mandible Claw and then break the chain, to use our Savage Sash that doesn't impact anything. We don't lose up potential damage from something like Assault the Wound. So this is just hiding information. We get six damage across the table for Enigma knows that we are going to break our Savage Sash and potentially that affects your blocks. Discarding Swing Big is a little unfortunate. Uh, we really would have loved to keep it considering that we have a Pulping to keep this chain going. Discarding red wild ride. It's unfortunate considering that we have a yellow wild ride in hand. Uh, so we are going four links wide this turn. It's a little obscured now because we broke the chain, but pushing big damage, Blood Rush getting across as a one cost eight damage card is really great. It's just, you know, Brute Variance is watching us discard all of these six into eight power attacks and keeping our five power attack. We deal a ton of damage, completely take tempo from Enigma, and the hand we draw into is kind of an interesting one. Three blues and a cast bones is okay. At this point, I'm opening the graveyard just to check on the amount of discard that I've played so far uh, for what's left in our deck that could potentially turn on Run Roughshod. We have some windups, but if we are looking at attacks that do it, we have one Bear Fangs, two Wild Rides, and two Pulpings. So it isn't completely unlikely that we would draw into something that turns on Run Roughshod, but if I am debating playing this Cast Bones, or playing a run roughshod, I don't mind arsenaling cast bones here. We're just gonna mandible claw for four. We'll discard agile windup to make my agility, as well as give the mandible claw go again, and then we'll attack with run roughshod for five. Having cast bones in arsenal is great because there is no chance that we can discard it to a wild ride or a pulping or draw it and a Blood Rush Bellow in the same hand. So we are just chunking away, holding onto a Cast Bones for the next time that we either block out with four cards or find some way to get go again and can take advantage of that extra action point. Going into another Cast Bones, it's pretty interesting. Here we are looking at a six power, seven power spectral shield and thinking about whether or not we want to block it. Uh, we definitely do. We have five cards. We can only use four of them. We could block with a riled up and on our turn, uh, play smash instinct for six with go again, then play cast bones, or we could block with cast bones and on our turn, Send Smash Instinct for six with go again, play Cast Bones from Arsenal, but then Arsenal a Smash Instinct. So we're thinking about whether we want to Arsenal Cast Bones or a Smash Instinct. 
Personally, I like Arsenaling Smash Instinct more than Cast Bones. Chaining them together is nice, but I would also like to win the game. And if our Smash Instinct hit, uh, our Cast Bones hits and we make six mites and one agility, being able to start a turn with Smash Instinct for 11 with Go again and Intimidate is really strong. So I like blocking with Cast Bones here. Um, but if we block with the Riled Up instead, that's still fine. We don't really need to give equipment here. We are at a comfortable 23. We could block with Scab Skins. There you know, isn't too much reason not to. The reason not to block with Scabs is if we wanted to stop a potential on hit, but I don't think Enigma plays any of those. The reason to block with it is to get our two block out of it in case Enigma goes very wide without breaking the combat chain. If we now have an a unused scab skins and Enigma can present you know, 21 damage in one turn, we're gonna wish that we had already blocked the scabs so that we could block with it again. I don't think Enigma's gonna do that, so it really doesn't matter. At this point, uh, let's play the cast bones from our arsenal rather than the one from hand so that Enigma doesn't know what we just arsenaled. She might think that we're holding on to an attack and that could affect how she blocks or attacks on her turn. Unfortunately, cast bones does not hit. We see a blood rush bellow in the top as well as a command and conquer. So we put ourselves into kind of a weird spot here where we have a pulping and a wild ride that both have a 50% chance to draw a miss off the top of the deck. We also have a cast bones in the arsenal. Looking at another uh, spectral shield coming in for eight this time can think about if we want to block that. The answer is very likely no, because our hand is not good at blocking. If I'm thinking about what I would like to do on my turn, it is gonna be play pulping, then over pitch, wild ride, and blue agile wind up. I float two resources, so if I draw a command and conquer, then I am either playing CNC for six, or I am discarding agile wind up to make agility and attacking with a mandible claw. If I draw a Blood Rush Bellow, then there is a 50% chance that I'm just discarding Agile Windup to make Agility, or that I am hopefully able to attack with a Mandible Claw as well. So that means that we don't want to block this from hand. Could think about blocking with equipment. I don't think the Flesh Bag matters, aside from just being two points of block. I don't think. Enigma's going to be able to play this card at, inst um, at reaction speed, and she doesn't have an action point. Maybe we somehow interfere with her ability to do something, but if nothing else, we are just giving her an arsenal for when we hopefully draw Command and Conquer. So we kind of get the worst outcome, weirdly. As much as I like drawing this Blood Rush Bellow, we don't have a way to make agility for our next turn. And if Enigma has a defense reaction, which she does, then we just take an intellect penalty. Now, if Enigma didn't have this D-react, if this was just Ward that kept her alive, then our turn is actually incredible. We attack with a Mandible Claw that has Go again, and then we play our Cast Bones and Arsenal Blood Rush Bellet. Instead, um, we're just in kind of a weird spot. Now we draw into a blue, so this is gonna work out for us. Enigma is making another uh, eight power Spectral Shield, but at the same time, it does only have Ward 1. Enigma has no Arsenal, very little blocking equipment. She is at an effective five right now. And with a Blood Rush Bellow, we're going to be able to threaten that life total. We are going to take cards out of her hand. So we will just not block here, holding on to those two points of armor. We're going to play Blood Rush Bellow. We're going to hope that it discards Command and Conquer, so that at the very least, we are sending Mandible Claw for six, and then Pack Hunt with eight and Intimidate. 
which should be enough to put the game away. We're going to send Mana Claw for six. We will play Pack Hunt, Pitch Wrecker Romp, discard Mighty Windup to make a Might. Still holding on to this Cast Bones and seeing what we draw into on the next turn, assuming we get that far. Pack Hunt is going to intimidate away one of Enigma's cards. Between a Sink Below and a Spring Tunic, she cannot live. Between a Hold the Line and a Spring Tunic, she goes down to one. And it just being Shimmers of Silver is not going to be enough to keep her alive. So we do pick up a win. This is one of my few wins against Enigma. Like I said, the hero is very strong. I think Kao has ways to beat her. I just don't quite know what they are yet or what that plan looks like. But if I am comparing something like Phi, my old hero, against Victor, this is not so bad of a matchup. I do just think with the games I've been playing, uh, Enigma takes a much different approach than we had versus Prism or Dromai. So stick with me over the next few weeks leading up to US Nats as I figure out how to crack this matchup. For this video, at least, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. If so, be sure to assault and batter that like button. My comments are always open for any questions or feedback. If you haven't already done so, please consider a YouTube subscription. It's free, it helps me out. But no matter what you do, catch me back here tomorrow for more daily fab gameplay. And until then, take care.